Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are turn, tuning in from. Uh, and welcome to the final session in the Rethinking Education webinar series. My name is Jeremy Booth, and I am the Director of Communications for CE International, Childhood Education International. Um, if this is your first time joining, uh, I'm going to share a couple of reminders that may be familiar with everyone else. The, this um, session is being live streamed directly onto YouTube. So that means that this session uh, is available live uh, right now, but it'll also immediately be available at the end of the session in case you're unable to stay for the entirety of, of the webinar. Um, you can share it with coworkers. You can refer to it later on um, whatever uh, you need for your convenience. Um, so it's uh, uh, something that can be helpful for you moving forward. And the second note that I want to share is there will be a question and answer section for the audience, um, but that will be uh, after our initial discussion that I will have with our esteemed guests who will be introduced shortly. So if you do have questions, um, I ask that you hold them until uh, we begin that question and answer section around the 40 or 45 minute period. Um, and that will be, you can do that uh, once we get to that point by clicking the Q&A button in the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, so without, before we get started, uh, I would like to have our esteemed guests introduce themselves uh, alongside everyone else who is introducing themselves in the chat. So why don't we start first with um, Dr. Youssef. Hi, thanks, Jeremy, and uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening. Uh, we're uh, glad that you know joining us from across the globe. And uh, we uh, discussion just we had with Jeremy to maybe have a, a pen on a world uh, map to uh, to see where where we all coming from. Uh, my name is Yusuf Al Hamadi. I'm the executive director of Knowledge and Impact uh, at. Uh, uh, a public uh, government entity in, in Abu Dhabi UAE called Early Childhood Authority. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf Hamas. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Great to see people from all times of the day and all parts of the country or the world here for our conversation. And my name is Tomas O'Rourke. I am the director and CEO of the Teaching Council here in Ireland. That's the professional regulatory standards body for the teaching profession. It's 111,000 teachers for a uh, population of 5 million. And we essentially license teachers to operate and work in publicly funded schools and oversee the standards of learning to go through to become and remain a teacher. So looking forward to the conversation very much. Absolutely. Thank you both so much for joining. Um, this is, as you're soon going to hear, um, we are all brought together by a, an affinity for rethinking education, for innovative thinking. Um, that's what uh, the reason for Thomas and um, Dr. Al-Hamadi, uh, Al Dr. Yusuf joining today. Um, and that is also an inspiration for uh, our magazine at Childhood Education International. It's called Childhood Education Innovations, which six times a year, uh, my colleague Ann Bauer compiles 10 to 12 articles from innovative, innovative educators from around the world. Uh, it's really a fantastic source for learning about new ideas and pioneering methods for education design and delivery. And if you are unfamiliar with the, the magazine, I encourage you to go to our website, ceinternational1892.org. Go to the top right corner of the screen under publications and click on the first item, Childhood Education Innovations, to learn a little bit more about that. Um, as I mentioned, the, the topic of this webinar and the whole series is rethinking education and specifically for the session, Rethinking Education in a Country. The inspiration is to advocate for a specific kind of mindset, which is to look at education challenges and ask the question, is this really the best way to learn and to promote learning? Um, that is what brings um, our two guests here together today. And I think it's likely the reason why uh, anyone who is attending is here as well, because they have uh, that same interest in thinking creatively about existing education solutions and promoting something, promoting solutions that um, open up opportunities for learners, all learners worldwide. Today, we're gonna zoom out a little further than we have uh, than previously and look at rethinking education on a national level. And initially for, for some of the attendees thinking about their daily work and their role that may seem like it, it could potentially be out of reach. However, as you're going to hear from our guests, Tomas and Dr. Youssef, it is critical that everyone is involved on a national level. Everyone in 
in this effort gets involved, they all have a role to play. And when, when we do come to a consensus, when a group comes together around a specific topic, it's hard to prevent the inspiration that, that brings those people together from growing and becoming something meaningful. That's the foundation of our panelists work. And that's the reason why CE International wanted to invite these two to talk about how their work is influenced by the greater population and the, and the greater collective uh, unit of people in their respective nations. Um, they are going to share how they engage their populations for the sake of all learners, um, which grows uh, from the previous topics of our initial um, session on rethinking education in a classroom, uh, which looked at the, the most granular level of what it's like for learners in the learning experience. And we zoomed out two weeks later um, to rethinking education in a community to see how communities can get involved. And now we're looking at the highest level uh, of the series and thinking about how this can be done on a national level. So without further ado, um, I want to set the stage uh, for the topic and thinking about this on the national level. This is something that we've done in all of the sessions and ask you, what, it, what do you think, um, Tomas and, and Dr. Youssef, what do you think rethinking education means at the national level and, and how do you determine, uh, define this in your own context? So we'll start with this first question by turning to uh, Tomas. Thanks, Jeremy, uh, and a great starter. Um, I think in a nutshell, in our experience in Ireland, and uh, it's just our experience, I, I'll hasten to add, rethinking education is in many ways about reframing the conversations. Um, so we're a small island nation, uh, I said 5 million. Um, we have 3,900 schools. A lot of those are small te to, uh, teaching principal schools, so two to six teachers uh, in a school. And some are very big, obviously. Um, and we still have many, many challenges. I speak to you this week, the national headlines are dominated by a lot of talk about a substitutes uh, crisis in, in schools and primary after years of various different methods and measures to try and implement change in the system. And we're still facing many challenges. And I think what we're discovering, therefore, is um, rather than come with a preset agenda as a national agency, be the teaching council or another agency in education, which might be well intentioned, but actually be a conversation stopper. Through a process I'll talk more about in the, in, later on the webinar, um, we're trying to actually start by listening and, and connecting the different layers of the system together where the MISO level or the middle level is not very strong. So you have lots of local communities, strong local communities, good, strong national agencies and government department, but the middle mediating level in Ireland, unlike other jurisdictions, wouldn't be as well, well developed. Um, so we're trying to find other ways of connecting voices. I love that we've built this series actually, from the very local, from the classroom, through where there are regional structures, like what we call education centers, and through to the national level in a more virtuous conversational feedback loop, rather than the classic cliche of a, of a vicious, vicious uh, circle. Fantastic, yeah, I, I agree entirely that this is particularly why we structured the webinar this way, is to, everyone has, a key role in, in this topic and in rethinking education and ensuring that the systems are um, aligned and that they are benefiting everyone involved. And it's something that clearly, uh, I know you'll dig into this a little bit more, but something that you do uh, at the teaching council very well. Uh, and the primary reason why it has been so uh, engaging to work with you. Um, so I'll turn that over now. Dr. Yusuf, how do you define rethinking education uh, on the national level and in your con in context? Uh, I, I think during one of the things that we look at, uh, uh, at uh, in Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, specifically in the ECA, uh, the Early Childhood uh, Authority, and we look into what we call ECD, the Early Childhood Development Sector in Abu Dhabi, and we look at it uh, from um, different angles. Uh, the first one, of course, would be the uh, early care and education, then the health and nutrition and child protection, of course, and then family support. And we see these are very uh, holistic and interconnected and interlinked uh, uh, um, uh, component. We cannot look to education in silos of any other uh, um, um, topics. So we, when we look to this, we all were thinking about how we look at it uh, holistically and we, we, we put all of this together uh, and we're working with, with the, you know, we are a policy and regulation um, uh, organization, but when we go and work with our stakeholders in the education sector and the health sector and the protection sector and the family support and development sector, we're trying to 
uh, you know, look at it from a holistic view. Uh, even the one of the program that I'll be talking about um, um, uh, every now and then is, is our 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 data system. When we look to the data, we look at it from a holistic view. So we bring data from health, from education, from financial services, and from kind of uh, activity and, and and stuff that that kids or the parents does do so we're trying to look at it uh, holistic so and we see that you know uh, children with high with experience high quality intervention has been proved many many times globally they have higher iq they are they have more probability of graduating from high school and they require less uh, less uh, intervention less uh, uh, resources to be allocated so we look at we're looking at education as a lifestyle more than just uh, a school thing. And one of the studies we've, we've done um, recently is, is to understanding all the services and resources that are provided for, for the parents. And we look specifically for an ECA to the, to the, to the children between zero and eight. So very specific uh, um, uh, population, very important population, very uh, crucial, uh, seg segment of the population we're looking at it and, and we, 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 we're looking at them as our, our client uh, as, as, um, that we need to serve. So we, lo we looked uh, in that study, we looked to all the services that are provided for, for the children and we found only about like only 35% of these services or resources are required, provided, needed uh, in the formal education system i.e. schools and, and, and nursery sort of thing, but most of the activity, learning activity and resources needed is outside the, 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 the formal education system in the parks, in the houses, in the buses maybe, on the beaches, on the libraries. All of these are, you know, you need to look at them uh, in, 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 in a way that's, you know, expanding all of this. Uh, we, we launched a program called Tech Queen, which is, you know, building something for, for the parents. We're developing one activity that, you know, giving parents the tools that support their, their uh, continuous education for their uh, children. And these are things that uh, we do. So we were, think, we're thinking even about teaching, you know, the way we've been uh, we've been taught maybe is something that we need to update to look at and this is uh, worldwide you know so we're launching programs on on teaching kids uh, for um, um, coding you know these are the future of skills right the, the the skills of the future and where you know most of the job that will be created in in these you know analytics data robotics technology sort of things so we need we want our kids to be ready uh, for kind of unknowns. We don't know what will be uh, uh, the world is facing, what are the skills that will be needed, what are the talent that's required globally, and where would that will be needed. Uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that's uh, uh, COVID may be proven for us is that, you know, a service can be provided from anywhere in the world. So we need to get those kids ready for, for the future by uh, teaching, them, teaching them and educating them on, 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 on new aspects of, uh, of the skills. Uh, and we do a lot of, um, as, as I mentioned, analytics, data analytics. We look to the phenomena from, um, uh, to start with from data uh, and we try to understand the impact and the magnitude of issues. And one of the things that we found that, you know, uh, um, um, uh, uh, absenteeism is a big issue. Uh, in many countries, and we saw that uh, in Abu Dhabi, absenteeism uh, is leading to low uh, learning level, which leads uh, uh, eventually to drop out of high school, maybe 25% of those uh, um, chronic absenteeism students uh, drops out of the school, out of the high school. So these are the things that we look at and we try to solve mm -hmm. early on. Fantastic. Thank you both. Um, there was a, a lot of information in there uh, that will be, is difficult to summarize uh, quickly, but there was a key word that I want to highlight that it, both of you, Dr. Yusuf, you used it specifically, um, it was holistic. And you mentioned you, uh, I, I know I'm familiar with both of your work, so I know this, this crosses, but Dr. Yusuf, you highlighted holistic in the learning sense of the word. You're, you're thinking about what education looks like, what topics are covered, what skills are provided. 
Tomas, you were talking about holistic from who is involved in the education process and getting this conversation, having it be a holistic conversation. And I think when you when you have that approach and looking at what the learning process is like and who is involved in supporting the learning process, then the results um, can be improved greatly. So that's a, it's difficult again to summarize everything that was shared, but I think the holistic mindset uh, is something that you both embrace and something that I, I also saw a lot of nodding heads as you were both sharing your answers. So I know there's an agreement there. And I'm happy to see in the, the chat, uh, the, the, our wonderful attendees always remind me to please do feel encouraged to share your own thoughts to these questions um, because all of you are experts in your own right uh, and it is valuable to be able to have that exchange. Moving on to the second question, um, well, you can start with Dr. Youssef, but when you're thinking about the work and that the ECA does, um, what was the primary inspiration for the challenges that you were seeing uh, for the work that the ECA does? What, what inspired you to rethink education and look at it uh, in a new way? Uh, I think the, 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 uh, um, the big uh, source of aspiration uh, and um, uh, motivation and innovation in the country is we're, we're a very young country, relatively 50 years old. We're, 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 uh, we're celebrating our uh, golden jubilee in, in, uh, in, in a, a month or so. Um, but the, the, that source comes from our founding fathers and our leadership that's, you know, always pushing um, the nation for the next frontier sort of thing. Where, and this is where, where ECA was, was created in the beginning. Uh, uh, we were thinking, the, the leadership of the country were thinking, okay, how we can help, how we can support those, the, the, the next generation of leaders in the country. And then they saw these kind of gaps or as a, a needed support in certain areas. So ECA came, came into existence. Uh, and we came as an as an entity to 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 think about what are the issues that you know facing the children today from education from neglect from a protection of the harm and abuse sort of things and and from uh, providing services and and resources for the parents so these are current ones the current challenges that's there but we need to to fix at the same time, we didn't forget what what gonna, gonna uh, what gonna the future bring to us. So we've been thinking, uh, you know, there might be some a future challenge that's uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that's not um, uh, addressed now. But if we don't start working on them, there will be the, the the issues of tomorrow, right? So we better be prepared. So we launch programs like we call World Early Childhood Development Movement, where we're bringing. Uh, thought leadership from across the globe to think with us together, what are the uh, future challenges? So these are the things that we've been thinking when we're doing. Of course, we got our inspiration from, these are some examples that I'm gonna mention. Uh, we established a whole university on uh, uh, artificial intelligence, Mohammed bin Zayed University, which is focuses on bringing best minds to, to come and do uh, uh, AI and machine learning and, and analytics. Uh, which I, I love so much as, as I'm coming from analytical background. And we're trying to work on, okay, now AI has been used in, in commercial and financial services, but how can these methods can be helped and, and support children? Example, Mazdar Institute was established uh, with collaboration with MIT to, 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 to bring in new researchers, a new, a new way of doing research in the country. Uh, the Hope Prop where UAE, uh, reached to the Mars. Uh, I mean, a young uh, country uh, uh, being the fifth country reaching to the to the Mars. Uh, that installed a lot of thinking within the education system. How can I prepare those those future astronauts? How they can uh, uh, do their research? How can they think of uh, as as a space uh, explorer sort of things? So these are the things that we're trying to bring as an innovative LOX AI. We're, we, we're, we're launching uh, 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 an innovation program called Angel Z, uh, which is Generation Z sort of things. Uh, but it, it, it does this kind of acceleration fellowship program where we're bringing uh, 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 gr uh, a growth level sort of startup from across the globe, uh, South Korea, uh, US, UK, uh, Pakistan, India, and other countries 
and we bring them here to UAE. We help them to localize their services uh, and Finland, we have companies from Finland as well. So Lux AI is, is, is developing uh, a robot that you know, can support uh, children of determination, which is a, a terminology we coined in UAE related to, to uh, uh, children with special needs. And this helping the uh, autistic children to develop and support them in, in their mission. So these are kind of some of the innovation aspiration the country has. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Yusuf. I, I love how you tied the values and the history of the nation directly into the education process. I know there are some similarities uh, with the work that Thomas does, but I don't want to assume I know how he's going to answer this question. So again, I'll uh, pose this to you, Thomas. What was going on in the education system in Ireland that led to some of the innovative work the Teaching Council is doing? Yeah, you're correct, Jeremy. Because there's the 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 um, foundations for our work are not dissimilar to that outlined by Dr. Youssef in terms of these major areas of public service or public services, the health, education, so forth. That maybe in policy terms are organised separately from the public's point of view it's the one child, it's the one adult receiving these services. And they want to see more joined up thinking along the lines of, of the um, strategic framework of the ECA. And some of the comments in the chat box here are reflecting the same, the sense of, we some will say our inter international terms, Ireland does quite well in terms of particular types of outcomes, let's say exam results and so forth, and those who went to the teaching profession. But if we look at the increasing emphasis on well-being, on innovation that Dr. Yusuf and others have pointed out to, and regardless of your state of development as a country, as some of the attendees here have said, it's about all children. That's your so therefore, while the system in Ireland does serve the vast majority of the young population very well, it doesn't serve every child equally well in terms of outcomes, in particular terms of even exam results. So there was the sense in which while we could say we're doing very well in many, many different terms, actually any self-improving system should always be taking time to step and look at actually, is this what education is all about? And what we're finding, if you look at the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, disability, for example, seems to point a way towards education and care co-locating more and more over time. Now that's probably about 10, 15 year vision, but that does seem to be the general direction of travel. So that sense in which we are doing very well, but in Ireland in particular, and it seems remarkable for a system of our size, of only 5 million population, with well-researched policy, with very strong research, very, with a strong uh, statutory agency in the area of special needs, for example, we would find in the political space time and again, what I would call acute local challenges of implementation keep popping keep happening. Um, so children with autism especially might struggle to get placed in their local schools, for example. And the centre will scratch its head and wonder, why is this happening when the policy stacks up on international terms, the research support in that policy stacks up. We've resourced CPD, we've resourced statutory agencies, we've resourced support services, and yet still, and particularly when it comes to special education needs, for example, it's a highly emotive space for parents, it's a highly emotive space for children, and it's a highly emotive space for teachers. Um, so there's something about the conversation we were finding that as we looked at this as a teaching council, though we look after the register of teachers, like the attendees here, that the learner is the litmus test of teaching. All teachers are learners too. So there was that sense in which we need to look at, okay, it's not so much about the what anymore, the what is important, curriculum is important, et cetera, the modes of assessment are important, but there's something else missing where we find this highly emotive uh, atmosphere emerging over something like inclusive education. And, at the, and so that was bubbling away. And at the micro level, I went to a symposium on creative education two and a half years ago in the Southwest. And the young people, it was, it was young people, it was teachers, it was policymakers from around the country thrown together in a gathering of 50 people. And the young people at the event spoke of breaking the system, very much like Greta Thunberg and climate change and this kind of very, almost very provocative challenge to the adults in the room and saying, what are you doing with, with our futures? And I spoke of discomfort because I, I don't I don't think our world history uh, paints revolutions in a good light. Revolutions claim to do a lot of things, but they rarely deliver sustainable change that changes people's lives the better in the socioeconomic sense, I would argue. Um, and I said I was, just, I was uncomfortable with this. And an attendee at the event put on the last day, uh, we have a, the chestnut tree, the, the seed of that tree we call the conquer. And she put a conquer emerging from its, its shell in my hand. And said, sometimes, Tomas, when the system seems to be breaking, something new and more beautiful is emerging. And look, just look at what's emerging from the conversations. So the innovation we looked at, I'll put the link here in the chat box. Accidentally muted yourself, Tomas. 
it's a it's a model for conversational engagement between teachers, parents, and students at the local community level. And the one teachers and parents will say, with the best of intentions, we haven't got the time to engage in new reforms or new consultations, whatever it might be. And we're we are exploring with the EU and the OECD. Is it possible to develop a model for local conversational engagement between schools to help everybody unpack education for themselves and make sense of all the wonderful work that national agencies such as Dr. Yusuf, such as ours would do, but land on the desk of one principal, one teacher, one parent, one maybe one set of parents or a family, many types and, and, and sizes, and they have life to live but at the same time express frustration about what the, the scale and pace of change and sometimes being left behind. So that innovation I've just posted there is very much about, is there a different way of doing things, a different way of talking about education so that the very local makes sense of things for itself, but also can connect to the national level as well. Yeah, I, I love the Beacons program because it does involve everyone. Um, and I think what you mentioned just now that resonates with a lot of uh, our former panelists and other sessions is that learning is, is a, a communal effort. Everyone is a learner. Everyone is involved in it. And if we embrace the value of learning, if we prioritize the value of learning, then that that can allow for everything else to kind of fall into place. And unfortunately, I think sometimes you get stuck in, in, in looking, you know, you have tunnel vision and looking at like how things should be done and, and you, you follow that path for too long, forgetting what learning, the, the root value of learning is, and you end up, you end up kind of forgetting what that, that end destination is. So, and I really love the analogy that, that uh, your colleague did with, uh, what'd you call it, a conquer? A conquered, like the chestnut tree seed. Conquered, yep. okay, yeah. I, that was a really beautiful symbolism. Um, I'm going to hold on to that. <laughs> so now kind of shifting into um, what I introduced in the very beginning about how bringing everyone together uh, in order to, to have this sort of community, in order to get everyone involved in the national effort. Um, I want, there's this kind of a bit of a two-part question to ask. You've, you've already talked about this a little bit, both of you, but what are your programs doing now and in the short term that are that really are rethinking education specific examples? And what do you hope others will do, uh, other agencies, other community groups, individuals uh, in your respective nations? What do you hope they will do in order to come together and make these innovations really sing uh, at a large level? So, uh, Tomas, we'll start with you on this one. Thanks, Jeremy. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's very much in that that beacons process space. Um, because really, almost counterintuitively, what we as a national statutory agency are trying to do is get others to do the rethinking in such a way that their own sense of agency is unlocked, but they also further enhance the policy response to their needs. So your second part of your question is really important because we want others to join the conversation. So it, we've had about seven of these events on a pilot basis um, around the country, outside of the capital city area deliberately, um, and brought together ordinary primary school students, post-primary students, these are ages maybe 5 to 12 and then 12 to 18, along with their teachers, their school leaders, um, and also national agencies have come to observe, it's just the interesting thing, the, the national VIP, so to speak, we're not the main participants. We can take part in the conversations, we can listen to the local communities. And what's interesting when you speak to communities, let's say um, in the heart of Dublin's inner city, whether it be uh, socioeconomic challenges, as well as in rural areas and the Western seaboard, there's this paradoxical mix both of, yes, local hunger to take almost charge of their own education or unpack it for themselves, but they want to know that the system leaders are listening and are responding. Um, and it seems remarkable in the hyper-connected world technologically, there's still that hunger. Even the, the local inner city communities in Dublin are literally 100 yards around the corner from the government department. Uh, but they will be almost the most concerned, the most anxious about the system leaders listening to them. So, and they, they are almost surprised by, by the VIPs coming, sitting down amongst them, talking to each other. So what, what we hope is that what happens at those events is that at the local level, the scales fall from people's eyes. We, we, I've witnessed firsthand children and school principals from the same schools say to each other, I never knew you were going through that. I never knew you were stressed as a school principal. I never knew you were stressed as a student in a, an exam situation. And as we've returned to some of these communities, you see these enhanced relationships 
leading to better well-being, leading to better learning outcomes, therefore, if you take that narrow metric. Um, and the national agency look at this and going, actually, this is a different way of framing the conversation of, of, and, and of joining our responses. And the other piece that we hope others would do, let's say the Council for Special Education or the Children's Ombudsman here in Ireland, is begin to, under, and in health in particular, are we really need to, that vision that Dr. Youssef outlined at the beginning, we need to really make realise that, make that real. Because the hunger and the impatience for separate delivery or for separate thinking is not tenable anymore, particularly post-COVID. Uh, we've learned how during COVID, the, the social, physical distance is no longer an excuse. You, you, you can connect with anybody in different spaces. So I think that's what we hope we'll do, that we'll, others will do some rethinking, will inform our thinking like all good conversations and other agencies will row into this process and we will build a more an even more responsive and even more connected system that moves in lockstep with local communities that that's the goal yeah so I, essentially it's it's having more conversations across more levels but the key component of that is that having that simply having the confidence to come forward and talk and speak and share your thoughts, but it starts with listening, which is something that you said in the very beginning. And so being willing to listen to another perspective, regardless of where it falls on the traditional hierarchy, uh, regardless of what sector they fall in, it's, it's being open to having to, to hearing another perspective first and then reflecting on it. Um, and I think that's something that you do really well. Um, Dr. Youssef, uh, what, exactly uh is the eca doing right now in the short term to re that's rethinking education and and what do you see the role how, what do you see others doing that can aid in in the national uh conversation and efforts to rethink education uh, we we do work very closely uh, with our partners at the government and we have uh, basically um, two main uh, um, kind of players in the ground where we have the, on the local uh, system, the Bulabi Education Department and Knowledge Department. And then we have the Ministry of Education on the federal where they're both impacting the learning, at least the official uh, learning, like um, the K-12 type of learning. But um, uh, there are, of course, a lot of players when it comes to uh, non-official type of training and, and capability building uh, rather than just education sort of thing. So that's how we look at it. And, and it's a, a life uh, time journey that a person takes uh, to learn and le re relearn and de-learn sort of things. So that's that's something we look at. So from our perspective, we, 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 we knew there are smarter people outside the room sort of things. We knew there are solution out there, tested, has been done out there. So and instead of reinventing the wheel, we went and scouted the world to product that you know can come to Bulabi, to UAE and, and with our support, with our involvement, with our you know making it uh, happen with our stakeholders and, and regulation and, and, and decisions and ma uh, making that you know we bring those startups to Abu Dhabi. We help them to localize their services and provide their services for UAE uh, uh, nationals, UAE uh, uh, residents, sort of thing. So uh, we brought few companies. Uh, these, these are just example. Kenderly or was in a mobile app to to raise the standard in early childhood development, managing nursery, nurseries and stuff. And during uh, during the pandemic, they trained like around forty four thousand uh, 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 nursery. Uh, personnel on the regulation and the practices and on the uh, how they can teach uh, those students who who who's not um, able uh, to attend the classes anymore. So that's provided the services at the time is needed. Affinity Data another example of chatbot where they work closely with the parents to tell them, okay, uh, with the kids between zero and six, okay. Uh, at this age, you're supposed to play this game and that game and this game and that activity. And by the playing and understanding what, what, what type of play the kids uh, say, um, 
they're playing, then they understand or, or propose a, 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 you know, a development plan for, for that kid and helping them. Helping them. Uh, Finland Way, we're bringing them to this year to Abu Dhabi and we're trying to work with them, you know, uh, as all of us, uh, uh, Finland and other neighboring countries are on the top of the world when it comes to education performance, specifically when it comes to, you know, PISA and other measurement, right? So uh, this, this startup uh, kind of bringing the, the Finnish way of doing nurseries into Abu Dhabi and we're trying to, to, to help and, and, and understand. We, we, we launched a program during COVID and in response to COVID called Ether, which means uh, it's an Arabic word for impact or legacy sort of things where, where uh, we launched this community engagement activity where we're bringing different community uh, partners from parents, from policy makers, from uh, decision makers, from uh, ECD experts and to the table in design thinking uh, way, uh, virtually of course, uh, because of the con uh, constraints, to understand what are the real uh, issues and challenges that facing children in Abu Dhabi during COVID. Uh, we came up with like around 47 issues with 250 possible solution for it. And of course we're working through filtration and prioritization and we came up with the three programs to, to focus uh, uh, specifically to the most vulnerable part of the population and kind of low socioeconomics uh, part of the population where they were hit the most because of, of the because of the impact of the COVID. And we launched three programs. One is, is learning through play. One is through uh, uh, kind of raising the star, we call it as a holistic uh, student management, not just in the school, but around the school at home and the garden in the park so it's a holistic view of the child again and also one of them is like uh, uh, building a community of tutors uh, we bring them you know someone can help the uh, his or her community to, to supporting those children so these are a few things that we try to build uh, and building you know a sense of community between the you know different players it's really refreshing to to hear someone in, in your position go into a room of other uh, high level experts and say, we're not it. <laughs> there are a lot of experts around the world and let's not pretend that we have every solution. Let's, let's bring this together. Let's share knowledge. I think that is a really, really powerful message um, that everyone needs to embrace uh, having that humility to, to come together and, and source solutions from around the world. And, and I think that is something that can really be um, done particularly well in today's day and age. Uh, and it needs, and we need to really take advantage of that. So thank you for sharing um, not only your programs, but just that, that general uh, mindset and that outlook. Um, we are getting close on time, but what you were just talking about, I thought was really relevant for, um, we still have two questions that I would like to cover because we were talking about the things that you do uh, and they sound wonderful in concept. And I know both of your programs are working really well, but for others in other contexts, it's, it's, it's valuable to know what kind of conditions allow that to happen um, and allow those, um, allow those programs to thrive. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what is going on in your respective countries uh, in terms of policies and, and what, what kind of um, environment allows those programs to thrive and to have success. And uh, Dr. Youssef, since you were just talking about some of your programs, um, we'll let you continue on this topic. Sure, sure. Um, uh, we, we provided a few things and we engage in a few, thing, a few things as a government here. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, they are focusing in two main things. Is, is one is the talent. You know, you can have all the technologies, all the resources, but if you don't have passionate, talented educators, then I think you have a bigger issue than you know uh, just uh, resources. So that's one thing that we work on, and then the government uh, provided uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, an incentive to bring uh, 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 best educator to the country, uh, and you know the same thing as 
we're not the best. We 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 need to collaborate with the world to bring the best here, right? So uh, you know, one of the things that we we did in the in the Abu Dhabi and UAE, we provided golden visa. Where you know, one of the issues were people coming in a, in a year or two uh, uh, visa, you know, job security, all those sort of family uh, relocation sort of things and burdens. Is, it's a big thing, and you know, people were thinking, should I take that risk with this short term? kind of mission so we we provided like this long term sort of things that come here invest in that uh, 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 as a talent uh, in the country and then we can support you to to uh, to to uh, thrive as well as you know support uh, our communities here so that's something we 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 try to bring the ecd expert in the world and and you know uh, we were uh, able to 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 provide this uh, incentive for a lot of international ECD experts in Abu Dhabi and UAE. The second one seems very uh, kind of financial and economics, but at the heart of it, it is more of of uh, of uh, supporting businesses to support the families. Uh, I mean, the 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 the, the kids and the education system, and specifically for small and, and medium businesses and startup. We, provided grants we provided uh, you know uh, that even that you know uh, that the the cost of doing business uh, was, was sliced by 70 percent so uh, so that's encouraging more businesses and education and other sectors of course to come and try we do a lot of research grants now and one of the program that we're running now uh, um, with uh, with the universities in UAE and of course outside the UAE of course we want to look at uh, we want to give a grant for, uh, for, for researchers and uh, an academician to look to those challenges and provide solutions. So these are a few things that we're trying to, to push the boundaries when it comes to enhancing education capabilities. This is very, very interesting, Dr. Yusuf, because uh, both of the, the policies areas that you identified had nothing directly to do with education. One was immigration related and one was commerce related. And uh, I think that's a really, really good testament to how education isn't limited to the walls of what we traditionally think of as education. Everything is influences that. And so you and your colleagues looked at what would allow programs such as ECA uh, to thrive. And it wasn't maybe necessarily a solution strictly from the ministries of education, but from okay. colleagues in other sectors. And so I, that's a really fantastic example. Um, Tomas, what uh, conditions have allowed um, your program and, and the innovative work happening in uh, Ireland to thrive? Thanks. There's one word Dr. Youssef has used a lot, I think speaks to part of the answer and that's community. And I'm mindful of the question you and Anne have asked before, or Diana should say, in terms of um, give, offering insights that would be useful to everybody, no matter what the context you're in. And every nation in the world, every person in a, any country has a story of community to tell. It might not always be a positive one, but we, we have all come from somewhere. We've come from a village, a place, a family, a tribe, a, a, a parish, whatever it might be. And that sense of community, I think, is is always is palpable in many many spaces. And that was that sense of community in Ireland has enabled us to go to space. That's number one. That sense that we've had for the last there's a, a, a major uh, native sporting organisation called the Gaelic Athletic Association, and seems to have fostered this sense of place amongst us that is not unique but certainly very very strong. So in 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 our national sporting association, the local club is almost more important than your county or national teams. Um, they, and you have the same players on both. So that sense of community and taking it seriously, it's not an add-on to education. It's not, what, that's not education. Why are you looking at that for? That actually is the crucible of people's lives, that sense of community. And realize, and, and working from that position of strength allowed us, number the, the second factor I would say is, uh, I think Dr. Yusuf as himself probably epitomizes this, but he's spoken of it, an appetite for risk-taking and lateral thinking amongst your system's leaders to walk into the room and have the courage to say, we don't have all the answers, would you ever help us out here? Um, and, and, and even to do that, especially at the national level is almost the most difficult because they're your peers and they're the ones who typically look to you for the answer. You're saying, we don't have all the answers. So an appetite for risk-taking, I think is number is second and, and the courage to stick with reforms um, and new ideas. Thirdly is not to overthink innovation. We have found in the Irish context, 
that when we've gone either within our own teaching council organization or across the Irish public sector to ask them, what do you think, what's innovation for you? And we produce a report and let's say another organization will look at the report and say, but you we're doing that. We never thought it was innovation. So any community, whether you're, whether you're work, any, any practitioner, any program leader, no matter where you are, there are others you have not yet connected with that you can connect with with new ideas to respond to your local need. And the more you begin to scaffold this, the more you realize actually there are people in neighboring regions or at the systems level who actually are thinking the same terms as you are. But it takes so much to step forward. And the fourth piece I would say in terms of how we're going to assess this, actually to model Dr. Eustace's philosophy, I don't know the answer to that one yet because we're working that out with the OECD. Um, that yeah. we have a two-year project uh, the EU and the OEC have given us 400,000 euros worth of support to both scale this model, it, 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 iterate it, see, try it out a bit more, and at the same time work out some kind of template for how to scale it further and how to ensure that both the local voices and the national voices have means of actually answering that question on an ongoing basis. Because if I had to answer that last question for the systems level, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you probably. But so there's that piece of having the courage to say, we don't we think this is a good idea. We think it will work for communities of the national system, but we've two more years to work this with the EU and the OECD to see what the answer to that last question will be. I'm hearing a lot of overlap uh, from both of you for, uh, in two counts in this frame, uh, in this sense is in the mindset, there's a, a humble mindset of not being afraid to, to try something new and admit that maybe you don't know how this is going to turn out, but it is worth trying because it, it allows, it's a new approach that hasn't been attempted before. And clearly the, the current systems are not uh, allowing education and learning to thrive at its, uh, at its you know, optimum uh, possibilities. The second one that I thought was really intriguing was that you both looked at your societies at large and not, you, you didn't, again, focus in solely on um, education and you thought, what could allow our country to embrace education and allow education to grow? And in your case, Tomas, I already mentioned uh, how Dr. Youssef addressed that, but in your case, you, the Irish community is something that is very cherished and celebrated. And you identified ways to directly incorporate education into that through beacons and, and the other work that is done at the teaching council. And so that again is, it's while policy uh, conversations may not be the most appetizing uh, option for a lot of viewers, it is important to be aware and think about what it is that allows uh, certain contexts to um, to provide further opportunities and, and more optimal opportunities for education to thrive. And, and particularly, and I'm thrilled that both of you are here in, in sharing non-traditional uh, approaches to that. We have one last question uh, that will bring everything back to um, our current reality. Uh, and the reason why we're doing this virtually uh, before we get into the um, question and answer section with the audience. And it's related to COVID-19. And um, I know this has had major impacts on education worldwide. Um, and I was hoping you could speak a little bit about how your organizations um, have adapted to the impact of the pandemic. How has the implementation of your innovation been affected? Um, and yeah, essentially that is it. So um, Dr. Youssef, you can go first. Um, uh, as you know, you know, a, a lot of, um, you know, COVID impacted the whole world and took us all uh, off guard. Uh, um, but, and, uh, you know, some of the impact that we've seen our research, we launched a, a research uh, with NYU University called uh, the impact of, uh, and I think one of the very first one to look to impact of COVID on children zero to eight, listening to those children uh, and their parents, of course. So, so we did that survey and we, we saw there's an, uh, uh, of course, there's a, a uh, mental issues that you know the the parents as well as the kids went through of course the increase of the screen time for school activities and non-school activities sort of things uh, and the issues you know uh, uh, parents being at home physically but you know uh, mentally at work sort of thing so that's a, a dilemma for a child uh, is uh, my dad or mom here or there so so that's a few things that we, we, we saw as, as a negative impact. But, but on the positive side, of course, uh, you know, the, the global ethics sector, I think, is, is, is kind of uh, more than doubled in the next five years. There is, we see a lot of uh, 
edutainment sort of activities. Uh, a lot of VCs now created specifically on education technologies. And that's something that we are uh, embracing and engaging with, uh, with the VC community on when it comes to early childhood and of course education specifically. So that's something uh, we, we, we look at this. Um, of course, uh, there is a, a greater uh, fluency uh, on the e-learning and the country adapted very quickly to the e-learning and, and, and kids were able now, as we just mentioned, uh, you know, the geographical and, uh, uh, or place of a person doesn't, you know, uh, limit our reach to those people and support uh, uh, of them. So these are a lot of things that we've seen, uh, of course, using and data and analytics uh, to support, to understand uh, uh, what are the platforms or using various platforms to generate more data about the, 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 the users, uh, specifically maybe children, to, to go and help and support them uh, through their journey. So these are a few things that's, you know, COVID impacted in, in the both side of the equation. Thank you for sharing. I think uh, certainly something that you touched on is parents um, becoming more engaged and involved in the learning process. And obviously there are implications with that, uh, perhaps the work limitations and so forth. However, it is um, always valuable when more people are involved and aware of what the learning process entails and, and more um, people, yeah, essentially are involved. And I think that is uh, often a good reminder, particularly because learning is a lifelong journey. So I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, Tomas. Yeah, it it's, has impacted on our innovation um, and the Beacons process because I think most people pre-COVID, and I include myself in this, would have kind of held to the cliche, well, there's no substitute for being in the same room with someone. So you know, we, we've had the technology to have these kind of webinars for years, but I always say you must be in the room, you must travel half around the world and burn your air miles and so on if you want to have a meet or the same in Ireland and drive around the country to go to, to different meetings. And therefore, when the COVID pandemic hit, our model went on ice for many, many months. Number one, we were coping with the systemic fallout and keeping the system going. And number two, we assumed, and one of the golden rules, I think, in life is don't make assumptions. We assumed that the model couldn't be replicated online. And it was, she was on the, call, on the attendees list earlier on. Catherine Doolan is a, a, a regional education leader here in Ireland, and she runs an education centre. And she reached out to us and with the, herself and some local community leaders we're looking at the ethnic diversity in their local community. So for many nations around the world, in the middle of Ireland, in a small, medium-sized town, there was 15, one, five different nationalities, as well as native Irish in their community. And they felt that they hadn't done enough to reach out to them. And there were, you, know, you might say the pandemic wasn't a good time to do it, but they said, well, there's never a good time to do it, and people are feeling more isolated than ever. So they wanted to run a Beacons process. We were ebbing and flowing in our lockdown measures. They wanted it in person. In the end, it couldn't be done in person. And we had to pivot online uh, because of the pandemic. And it worked just as well. You had to adjust the methodologies and so forth in terms of gathering, you know, hearing the voices. But that definitely, we, we, it forced us to go online and should actually, no matter where or when, this model can certainly be, be piloted and worked. But the other pick up on the factors Dr. Yusuf has referred to, if anything, the pandemic has strengthened the need for our innovation because it has opened people's eyes to what education is really about. A, a strong element of national discourse in the media in the first six months was education is, no, is not really about, not just about academics. It is a relational endeavor. It's about education, it's about people helping people to learn. Teachers helping teachers, teachers helping students, students helping teachers and so on. And the pandemic forced parents and teachers alike to actually realize it is about all the people in a child's lives. The more, and it really has drawn a, a very glaring spotlight on the inequities of technological access. So a lot of children who can, you know, were falling behind because there might be only one device in a household of 10 people, or the broadband was either non-existent or very weak. Um, not widespread, but that's not good enough. So the, that it has really highlighted the need for better connections technologically between home and school, better connections relationally between home and school. And while therefore the same challenge of time remain, there seems to be a more appetite for, well, that's no longer sufficient. We can't simply dismiss this need or this need for conversations purely on grounds of time, because when we had to, we did. When we were working from home and supporting our child's education via the iPad or the laptop, we had to make it work in some shape or form. 
So the pandemic has forced certainly us to pivot the methodologies of the process, but I, I almost paradoxically, not ironically, has increased the appetite of many parts of society for this to try it out, because we now realize how vital those connections physically and relationally are between home and school. Absolutely. Uh, again, getting back to that education and learning being a holistic process. And I think what you mentioned about the um, disparities is true in so many parts of the world. And I think it, it does raise the need to think of innovation, rethink innovation for the sake of education as well, that innovation should not, we should not limit our concept of innovation to technological solutions or providing um, laptops and iPads. It simply is unrealistic in a lot of cases. It is very beneficial when it can happen. It should be um, embraced whenever possible. However, we also need to get back to the root of learning and ensuring that there are uh, mechanisms in place that allow learning to uh, to occur in every context and in, in, in every learner um, so that those disparities don't continue to grow. So thank you both so much um, for your thoughts on all of these questions in this topic. It has been a really, really engaging discussion. And I want to now open up the opportunity to our audience um, to ask some questions to our panelists, um, Tomas O'Rourke and Dr. Youssef. Um, if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it is uh, and it, not, not in the chat. The chat can be sometimes a little um, overwhelming. So if you do have a question, please drop it in the Q&A section, uh, focusing on the topics that we have covered today about rethinking education on the national level, policies that have allowed ed education innovation to thrive, the specific programs that uh, of teaching council of the early childhood authority in Abu Dhabi. Um, if you have any questions for our guests, please do drop them in the Q&A section now. Allow people a moment to check them out. Okay, so we have a question from Fida George, a specific question about um, the age the, of when children um, begin formal education. There are multiple questions in here that are uh, <laughs> difficult to synthesize into one. Um, and I think the, it's, it's one question that she asks is, uh, or Vita asks is at what age do children in the countries begin formal education? This obviously, uh, sometimes varies uh, on context. But uh, Dr. Youssef in, in the United Arab Emirates, what, at what age do children begin formal education typically? Um, it, it depends on how, how you define uh, formal education. Do, do nurseries count as, uh, as, a, as a formal education or KG is the, 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 uh, or kindergarten program or FS kind of program that's counted or grade one? So grade one usually uh, at um, age six and from four to six, there is a KG program that, you know, uh, still optional, but the mandatory is from grade one, which is six years old. And then, and now uh, something that we are trying to, to embed in the population is, 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 is raising the, the, the enrollment in the nurseries. Uh, which is, you know, uh, um, still a law in Abu Dhabi and something we are trying to push, uh, you know, um, uh, first of all, provide high quality uh, nursery services uh, for the population uh, distributed among the, the communities. Uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, then um, encouraging uh, parents to, 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 engage uh, or register their kids in the nurseries at least from your four, uh, two to, uh, to four. Um, there is a specific things about UAE as a, as a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, community and family based organized, I mean, society, uh, we have extended families. So usually even if the mom or dad is working, they can safely uh, uh, keep the kids with their grandma or grandpa sort of thing. So there is, uh, it's not as urgent to push, uh, to put the kids in the nurseries, but, you know, providing 
that incentives uh, and thoughts for the child, for the for the parents. That's you know when the kids goes to the nurseries, this is there are more of uh, activities and uh, confidence building and, and interaction, and 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 you know exploring the world outside the house sort of things. Thank you, Dr. Youssef. Uh, very comprehensive answer. Uh, Thomas, would you care to share a little bit about the ECD structure uh, and, and grade levels and ages uh, in Ireland? Yeah, no problem. So in Ireland, a, the compulsory age for starting primary education is six, but typically most children start at age five or, or thereabouts. And there is a government funded um, system of early childhood education for the two academic years prior to the commencement of formal primary schooling in addition to that. Then you have obviously uh, privately run uh, child care services for ages prior to that, again, from birth to typically three, three and a half. Um, so parents will typically pay fees and so on. There are system supports and, and grants for, for that sector, but a fully funded early childhood education uh, process kicks in two years prior to primary school. The staff qualification is an interesting issue because it's coming more and more to the fore. Um, it was even pre-pandemic. Um, so you have, there's a common curricular framework bridging the early childhood education space and the early, the first two years of primary. It's a Gaelic word called ashter. It means journey or, 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 or travel, you know, a journey of learning. Um, and so all children, regardless of what's early childhood, are in what's the first two years called infants classes in primary, follow that curricular framework. And that brings in the primary school, it's registered qualified teachers who have to study to degree level four years concurrent or two years postgraduate to become a qualified teacher. But the qualification levels are improving in the early childhood space, but are a step or two behind that. And that then feeds into the terms of conditions of employment and so forth, which is a, a concern from everybody really in the system. We're trying to increase standards there across the board. So you depend on the, on the setting um, and the age of the child, the level and qualification of the staff will, 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 will vary from one sector uh, to another. But I think a lot of thinking is going on a systems level, how to enhance the connections between childhood education and primary school. Mindful, as I said, of course, of the convention, the UN convention, the rights of people with disabilities, and the, the longer term, I think, trajectory of education and care and therapeutic services being more and more co-located. Co Thank you. Um, yeah, to both of your points it's the the systems obviously vary uh there's not um, one specific answer for every context and there's a, a lot of different tracks but um it is always informative and insightful to hear how uh this that process works in different contexts um dr yusuf you have a specific question from asia foster about what is the eca's approach to address gaps in school readiness between private nurseries and kindergarten and grade one uh the, the fact in Abu Dhabi that uh, uh, more than 99.9% .9 of the nurseries are privately owned. Uh, so the government only uh, regulate the, the, the sector, but it's only uh, and, uh, it's operated and, and, and owned by the uh, private uh, investors. So what we see, we but we did a lot of, uh, and we're, we're doing that now as, as part of, uh, uh, you know, part of the ECA inception, that there is an issue there. And that's what we're trying to first understand, then trying to solve with our uh, stakeholders. And uh, so we're trying to understand what are the, the, the quality and what type of quality services and that we're, 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 we're uh, initiating a quality assurance program when it comes to uh, nurseries and uh, Mace with us on the call, she's leading that project where we're trying to understand what are the quality assurance that's uh, uh, there in the, in the, in the nursery uh, programs and how we can elevate their, uh, their, their quality. And then that provide these, uh, you know, input provided for the KG services, which is, um, uh, you know, distributed between the government and the private sector to, uh, in, 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 in terms of ownership. And then uh, hopefully with that understanding that the, the, both uh, the nurseries and the KG for quality assurance uh, and standard, then hopefully we can help addressing the gap. So basically, um, there is a, 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 a methodology now we are working on to understand the, the and quantify the gap, and then we'll be working on and uh, and solving those gap. And one of the things that we're, we're working now on, again, doing design thinking sessions 
with with educators, with uh, with uh, policymakers, with uh, teachers, with uh, with parents to understand from them what are the real gap between the two systems, and then we're solving an issue that people faces uh, on the ground and instead of doing our own disk research and come up with solution that's you know we only see as a problem instead of the uh, on the on the instead of the real uh, people on the ground thank you dr yusuf um i am sensitive to the fact that i know both of you have other um other prior commitments so i would like to take maybe two more questions before we wrap up here uh there is one from Peace Martins that uh, talks about the challenge of uh, the education system at the national level not having significant investment. And so how it's, she's asking, or Peace is asking about how to achieve innovation in a country where that is the case. So I think it is summarized nicely by saying, um, how does one engage and get the funding and policy support needed to transform education at the grassroots, grassroots level, which I think speaks a lot to about uh, both of your work. How does one individually uh, influence and get the support at the grassroots level to um, influence innovation in education? Either of you can answer. I might kind of, you know, I think um, it's a really good question because it happens in our case in Ireland that the drive, well, in once it came initially from us as a national statutory agency, the Teaching Council, but as per the story I told earlier on, that idea came to me certainly from um, kind of being, being open enough to engage in an event with people of all ages and sizes across the system and just listen to the conversation happening. But if you're in a position where either there are no such national agencies like a teaching council, or there are, but they don't seem to be have the same attitude perhaps as we have had here uh, in Ireland, I, I can't remember who said it, but there's a quote somewhere that says, you know, never underestimate the power of a small group of people to change the future of the world. Indeed, nothing else really has. So, I mean, Dr. Yusuf and I are, are, are individuals working within systems. We happen to have the privilege of working at certain levels, but we are individuals. And every time we achieve something, I, I, I hope it's one of the both of us when I say this, I in, achieve it by engaging with people like me and other organizations who we connect on that same values base or goal base. That's just true for anybody at the local grassroots level. I, I think if you find it and you feel that there, there is that, that, that national support for you, you should hopefully have somebody in your local area, your local institution, your early childhood setting, your school, who you could start a small process to work up between yourselves. What can we do where we are right now? And crucially, the one thing I would say, what, what people at all levels of the system rarely get, don't often get right, is making sure to plan for capturing your story as you go along. So when, if you find yourself in a meeting with the minister, because that happens all the time, the people move around, ministers go to functions, officials go to functions, and they say, tell us, you know, and you say, I've got a great idea. Great. How has it been so far? Uh, you can't leave that silence hanging. You, so make sure you've got a good story to tell, even by, because when we got the support from the EU and the OECD, we'd only run six events across the island. But if we happen to maybe tell the story in such a way that we could say we will address resilience goals, educational goals and so on, and we got their back in. So I think I, I, I'm an optimist at heart. And I think no matter where you are in a system or what your context might be, there are one or two others at least you could start a conversation with. But remember to capture your story as you go along so you can tell us in an engaging way to whoever you happen to be talking with in, in a different space and time. A fantastic piece of advice. Thank you. Tomas. Um, Dr. Yusuf, would you like to add anything? Uh, I, I think what Tomas said is, is, is exactly right, where, where, where you, know, you need to, to work with, with the human capital that you have is more than just the investment and, 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 and technological tools. It's, it's about the passion of the people. And when they see it eye to eye, this is a challenge that we need to, to work on. And a benefit is beyond uh, certain individuals um, uh, scope, but it is, you know, goes back to the community in exponential way sort of thing. So that's, I think, uh, building that nudge and building that, you know, believe in the general public, I think this is very important. Too. I agree as well. Um, we only have time for one more question, uh, which um, 
I apologize to others who have asked questions. Uh, there will be, once you close this window, there will be a survey. So feel free to share those questions with me. Uh, I wanted to close with one that I thought would be applicable to uh, all of our viewers. Uh, it comes from Angelina Carpio Reyes, which is asking if there is an education system that can be more or less universally applied that can impact the future of education posi positively, or perhaps maybe an education approach that you believe would be universally applicable. I don't think there will be, I'm, I'm, I'm not education expert to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a data analytics. Uh, Thomas will, will let us know more about it, but uh, I don't think there is, you know, one size fits all sort of things. And, you know, in, 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 a, in a hyper connected world, we're talking about personalization of education and services. So I think it will depends on case by case, the need of individual rather than even the community itself. Fair enough. I, I think Dr. Yusuf has been very humble there because I, I do think data forms part of any answer. I think different countries are different stages of development on that, but nobody to my mind has cracked it fully. How do you gather information, evidence in such a way as to improve the experience and the quality for everybody? Um, we're getting better at it around the world, but I, I, I speak to many, you know, teaching other bodies in Australia, Asia and the States and Canada and so on. Um, so data has formed part of the picture. He, he is absolutely correct. I'd be the first to say, you know, one size fits, or the last one to say one size fits on, the first to say models will vary. But I would be so kind of bold as to, to suggest that it's clear from all the comments in the chat that I'm seeing here from Dr. Yusuf's comments, there's an innate hunger to make progress. And if you feel you're not making progress, that's where the data piece comes into play, because that's part of your, how do you know you're making progress by looking at the data? So if we all are instinctively hungry to make progress at the local community level, regional and national level, be that you know, economic performance, um, quality of life, well-being, mental health, and whatever it might be, creativity. I think a system, one, one thing I'm discerning across systems and jurisdictions and political systems of all kinds, is an increasing hunger for um, res joint, a responsive system. So this sense that we have an issue now and the system might catch up in five or 10 years time, people around the world are saying, no, we want answers now. Climate change, for example, demands, demands that. And it doesn't really care climate change, whether you're ready to or not, because it's coming, it's here. So I think a system that knows itself, it's responsive and is making progress on agreed values and outcomes. The, the values and outcomes will vary from one country to the other. Uh, what's important to one, but there are also some common desires as well. And I think, therefore, it's not much, much about the model, it's about the process. How are you engaging at different levels of the system to determine if you're making progress, where the gaps are, how you're addressing those gaps, and how, what are you trying to learn in terms of professional development or CPD to help address those gaps? And that could be a universal piece. So your metrics for progress will vary, your values will may vary, but I think human history shows we are keen to make progress. And education is the has been shown to be a, an absolutely the vital element in helping us all to make progress. So I hope that that's of help. I couldn't have wrapped this up any better. Education is the key to progress. That's exactly what I was hoping for at the end of this uh, webinar series. So thank you for closing us out on that note. Um, I would like uh, both of you to maybe just uh, point out, uh, share a little bit about how um, the attendees can maybe learn more about the work that your organizations are doing. Um, Dr. Youssef, where, where should they just go to the ECA website? Uh, yeah, ECA website, I think we have a couple of uh, platforms, the, the ECA uh, main website, and then the program I mentioned, TACWI, which is providing resources for parents, and it's www.eca.gov.ae. I'm going to type it in the chat. Thank you. And mm. from... from yeah, just briefly, Jeremy, uh, I've just put in the web in the chat there, teachingcouncil.ie is our main website. We're also on social media, on Twitter, Ask Teaching Council, all one word. And if you Google us, we're on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. Um, so you can connect with us there as well. We'd love to hear from you. Perfect. Thank you both again so much for um, participating in this final session of the Rethinking Education webinar series. This is a wonderful note to close on. 
Uh, thank you to our attendees who have um, been joining us from around the world, uh, taking time out of their days and their nights, uh, their sleep time to learn about rethinking education. A uh, couple of quick reminders. Um, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with our magazine, Childhood Education Innovations, you can find that on our website, centernational1892.org. You can also scroll to the bottom of that website if you're interested in more of the work that we do uh, by clicking, scrolling to the bottom and clicking receive updates uh, about future events and, and news that we will be sharing out. I encourage you to do that. And um, again, the, oh, also this, uh, this will, I'm seeing a question. This webinar is recorded on YouTube. It will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, and also when you close this uh, window, there will be a survey. Uh, we appreciate any feedback that you can provide because uh, this will help inform our uh, future activities as well. One last time, thanks to our panelists, thanks to the attendees. It has been uh, a massive pleasure to share the, this topic with all of you and to hear from all of you around the world. We wish you all the best and stay healthy and take care. Thank you.